Well, welcome to module two on the uh, condition and prognosis reports. Um, Sarah, let's move on to the civil procedure rules. Um, just generally, what are the civil procedure rules? Well, the civil procedure rules are a set of rules that we have to follow when we follow a legal claim. In the civil courts, obviously. In the civil courts, yes. Yeah. And that applies to all proceedings, doesn't it, in the High Court? It does, yes. Yeah. Um, do they do the civil procedure rules apply to condition and prognosis reports? Well, arguably yes and no. At the very beginning of the case, if you're getting an informal opinion, ad hoc opinion, you've had a phone call from a solicitor, can you advise um, briefly on condition and prognosis? Then they don't have to be in a set up format. Sure. But once things have got more formal, once it looks like there's going to be a legal claim, then yes, they do. So as we said in module one, it's best to take a one bite of the cherry approach and work on the initial report as if it were compliant so, with yes. the CPR. I think you'd better be speaking, sorry. Um, what do the rules actually say about condition and prognosis reports? They're really very helpful, actually. Um, there's a lot of information as to what the courts want to see in condition and prognosis reports. I think um, it's all out in the materials, but very briefly, things um, pre-action protocols very helpful on condition. It asks that there's reference made to the claimant's pre-accident me um, medical health and then to comment on the serious of the injury and whether that injury is going to be ongoing. And I think it's right to say that uh, experts do actually need to know this material. Oh, definitely, but it's a help. It's not really um, a hindrance to have to look at it. It will assist them. So definitely read that material. <laughs> definitely, definitely read it. Um, what about prognosis and the CPR? Again, it's very helpful. It tells you what the court are looking for. They want to know whether the claimant has got an ongoing injury or disability. They want to know the extent of that. And why is that important to the court? Well, it's really important because the condition and prognosis report is a tool for valuing a claim. And it's crucial that you have as much information as you can so that both parties are able to accurately predict how much that claim is going to cost. I see. Um, you mentioned continuing uh, disability. Anything else to say on that? Yeah, if um, a claimant does have a continuing disability, please give as much information about it as you possibly can so that both parties are aware of it and are able to value it. Now, in terms of the actual, uh, we, we talked in Module 1 about uh, the expert actually meeting the claimant. Any advice about that interview, particularly about uh, continuing disability? Um, do as much preparation pre-interview as possible and just be as detailed as you possibly can about the continuing disability. It's, it's quite difficult because in a way we'd like to have a prediction as to if the disability is going to resolve and in an ideal world, the exact date when it will resolve, that's probably not going to be possible but a big detailed conversation with the claimant might help establish... So the idea. advice is read all the material before, make sure you're clear on the instructions before you actually meet the claimant. Um, what about any recommendations for treatment? Yes, it might sound strange because when a claimant comes to visit an expert there isn't a doctor-patient relationship there. However, if it becomes very obvious that there is a course of treatment that would really help the claimant, then the expert does have a duty to point that out. There is a duty to do that? There is. They can be criticised and have been criticised if they have been found to be prolonging the claimant's in injury. Because, of course, the claimant has a duty to mitigate. Yeah, definitely. It's in no one's interest, when you think about it, for the claimant yeah. to remain in a poor state of health. Sure, sure. Uh, anything else that the expert needs to consider at this point? The expert, just to make sure they've got all the materials, that they know what they're going to be asked to report on. Now, that might sound strange, but sometimes the instructions from solicitors aren't as clear as they could be. So I would say make sure they know. Well, I think it's right to say that in this particular field, there are some solicitors that do it day in, day out, and you're going to get a very good set of instructions. But what happens if you if you get perhaps somebody from a smaller firm that the instructions aren't particularly good? Any advice for the yeah, experts at that point? Pick up the phone and, and say, ask for further clarification. No one's going to think any less of you for asking questions. As I've said before, it's probably the fault of the solicitor for not making things clear. But if you know precisely what it is you need to 
look at when you're examining the claimant. It will make the whole process quicker and smoother. But I think it's right to say that the expert should tell the expert, the solicitor, that rather than just going ahead and doing that. Definitely. It's, uh, to, to just do a report when you haven't got the clarification can lead to all sorts of problems in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the form of the report? Well, again, the rules are really helpful on that, and I would advise the expert to have a look at the materials. Uh, is there anything else in the rules that you'd like to uh, highlight for experts, or just read the rules? Yeah, there is actually. Obviously, read the rules. But just to point out that the rules make it very clear that the overriding duty of the expert is actually to the court, not to the party who's paying them. So really, the expert is there, rather like a talking textbook, to give the court assistance with the expertise that they have. So it's a rather schizophrenic relationship, isn't it? They're paid by a solicitor, but their duty is to the court, so they have to remain independent. Um, and in terms of... Um, we as solicitors obviously understand the importance of time limits. Any comment on that? Because... Part of the thrust of the civil procedurals is, of course, to make things timely and to reduce unnecessary cost. Do experts need to comply with the time limits? Oh my goodness, definitely, yes. I mean, um, time seems to be getting shorter and shorter for legal proceedings. The emphasis is on getting things done quicker. It seems to be more beneficial for everyone if cases can go quickly. So time limits are crucial and courts have proven to be less keen now to give extensions of time. In the past, extensions of time that could be given for um, expert reports. Not sure that that's going to happen in the future. And if you don't comply, then the penalties for the expert and more specifically the party paying them can be quite extreme. Well, ultimately, of course, the claim can be thrown out. Yeah. And uh, the expert or the solicitors could have been be liable for the whole claim. Yeah, which would be a nightmare scenario. Or even still, you could have it that the expert report's late and the court say, well, you can't use it now. Right. So the experts done all that work for nothing and the instructing party hasn't got a report to rely on. So in essence about the civil procedure rules and the supporting regulations, read them, <laughs> know them, understand them, comply with the time limits. If you're unclear about instructions, go back to the solicitors, get those absolutely clear. Well, we're coming on to problems in Module 3, so thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. So thanks very much. That's the end of Module 2. Uh, in module three, we'll be looking at problems. Thank you.